All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this IGINC webinar. Uh, Hunt Demarest from Par Mellison Associates will be talking to us about financial literacy. Take it away, Hunt. Awesome, thank you. Um, yes, I just want to thank everyone for deciding to choose your day or mid-afternoon, depending on where you are, to learn more about your financials. Um, so kind of going to go down through here, um, go over some overview of some financial information, and then open it up at the end to go through some questions and stuff like that. Um, probably going to leave everyone's microphone. Can you mute everyone's microphone for right now, Maddie, or ask them to mute? Um, because without fail, someone doesn't realize that they have their microphone on and we're getting feedback and stuff like that. Cool. So kind of go through here. Um, you know, Maddie's going to mute everyone. If for whatever reason you want to stop, you have a question or something like that, please feel free to unmute yourself. Say, hey, Hunt, can you go back through there? Um, if it's something specific to that, if it's something that you kind of want to elaborate on, probably just leave it to the end and I will open up some time there for that. So let's get into this. So just got to share the screen here. Perfect. So the general overview here of what Maddie wanted me to cover is just kind of the basics of, you know, what should a shop owner be looking at as far as financials goes? You know, if nothing else, you know, what are the basics? What do we need to kind of get into here? And so what I want to do is kind of share the way that I look at financials. You know, I have the luxury or, you know, however you guys want to look, look at it, the punishment of I look at shop financials all day, every single day. Um, kind of have a unique ability here to be able to say, hey, what makes a good shop? You know, what makes these shops that do really well tick? And what makes the shops that struggle really just never fulfill their goals? Where, you know, are things going right? and Where are things going wrong? Um, but in order to do that, we need to be able to have a good understanding of our financials, at least the baseline of it, to be able to Am I good? You can hear me again now? All right, cool. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is just get a general overview. So we're going to go into the profit and loss first. We're going to go into the balance sheet and then analyze cash flow. Kind of, you know, where most people are comfortable first is the profit and loss. But I want to go over the basic overview of what that should look like in a general, you know, layout as far as percentages and stuff like this go. And so on our profit and loss, we really have three categories here. So we have sales, we have expenses, and then we have cost of goods sold here. Okay, so we got sales, less our cost of goods sold, less our expenses. We subtract all this stuff out, then we hopefully get profit dollars. What happens is a lot of times people look at this and they just look at this number down here. Hey, am I making money? Am I losing money? And if they're making money, then they probably say, you know what, I don't even need to be looking at my profit or loss statement. I'm doing something right. Um, if they're losing money, then usually what they do here is they go up to the top line. Well, hey, if I'm losing money doing a million dollars in sales a year, then maybe I need to bump to 1.2 because as I drive my sales, I'm going to make more money. When in actuality, that almost never happens. And it's really an inverse relationship. What I see all too often is people driving their sales, but they're not making any more money. You know, whether you go from $600,000 up to a million dollars, or if you go from a million dollar shop and you say, you know what, what's an easy way for me to make more money? I'm going to open another location. You know, the old adage of, hey, working harder, not smarter is very true and especially true in this industry. We see it all too often. And really what I want people to look at is you need to understand your financials. You need to be able to maximize your business to the full potential that you have. Maximizing your business nine times out of 10 does not mean driving sales. You can always do more, you can always sell more, but what ends up happening is as you sell more, all your other expenses are going up just as well. Or if you have some underlying issues, sometimes those are magnified as your sales level increase. And so what we need to do here is we need to break down and kind of put what I see as the core structure of a business. And so the first thing here, right like before, is we have sales and then we have cost of goods sold. And if we subtract that, that is gonna be our gross profit. And what we wanna do is we wanna look at that as a percentage. And then after our gross profit dollars, we have our fixed expenses, and then that's gonna give us our profit here. So a couple of clarifying things on here. The way that I'm looking at this, in cost of goods sold, there's gonna be technicians in here, obviously gonna be parts in here, and then there's also gonna be service advisor. 
just for this exercise, that's how I'm looking at. I know that there's different people out here that don't look at service advisors or cost of goods sold. Um, another thing to note here is when I'm going through these percentages, these are also loaded costs. So the technician is not just going to be straight labor. That's going to be their associated benefits, payroll taxes, and all the stuff that go along with it. So all of our production payroll is up here in cost of goods sold. Down here in expenses, that's going to be any payroll that I didn't previously mention. So admin payroll, office payroll, officer payroll, all that's going to be down here in expenses. So one of the first things that I want to look at when I'm looking at an overview of a financial statement is I want to see if it fits in this framework. The framework that I'm going to go off of here is our gross profit percentage should be 50%. And then what we're looking at is we're looking at our total expenses as a percentage of sales. And so our total expenses as a percentage of sales should be 30%. So if you're doing the math here, if we have sales less our cost of goods sold, gives us gross profit dollars of 50% of that, we then have our expenses that are 30% of our sales. In turn, this should leave us a 20% net income. Now, I am oversimplifying this, right? This is in a perfect world. This does not work for every single shop, but this is the first thing that I look at when I look at shops financials to get a general sense of where things are going right and where things are going wrong. Are you maximizing your gross profit dollars and your overhead is just too expensive? Or is your overhead very cheap, but you're just not looking or you're just not selling enough or you're not selling expensive enough. And so let's kind of go down through here and give a perfect situation of what a million dollar a year shop should look like. And so if we're at a shop and we have a million dollars coming in as sales, I would expect to see $500,000 in cost of goods sold. Remember, cost of goods sold is gonna encap encapsulate technician, service advisor, the actual parts cost, tires, battery, all the stuff that directly goes along with our sales. That's gonna now give us $500,000 of gross profit dollars. If we have a million dollar a year shop, we know our overhead should be 30% or in this situation should be $300,000, which is how we come up with our bottom line of $200,000, a 20% net. So this is the general framework of a shop when I start looking at it to be able to analyze where the pain points of this business are. And so let's kind of go in here and change some different things. If I'm looking at this and this shop has fixed expenses of $500,000, then we no longer have $200,000 of net profit. We have zero. We're not making any money, right? And so if I'm looking at this, I'm automatically going to look at this and say, you know what? Our fixed expenses are 50% of our sales. We know our target is 30%. I got horrible handwriting here, guys. I'm typing more than I'm usually writing. But we're at 50% of our sales. And so I'm looking at fixed expenses and I say, hey, this is the issue here. Our fixed expenses are too expensive. Now, the unique thing on fixed expenses is I'm not a huge fan of budgeting. And when I say I'm not a huge fan of budgeting, I mean it in the literal sense of pinching pennies, having a set target, because in reality, it just doesn't work for most shops. Is there discretionary stuff that you guys have in expenses? Sure, but more or less, whatever your expenses are for your business are probably set that way for a reason. Some of the two biggest expenses that I see for a business is gonna be advertising, it's gonna be your rent. Rent is what it is. You're almost never gonna be able to negotiate a lower rate with your landlord. If you are the landlord, then you might be able to, but there's probably a reason that you set it that, uh, at that amount. And then the other one is advertising. Advertising dollars are something that I don't almost, I almost never want to budget that because if I'm looking at this and let's say this is a situation here, if I'm spending 10% of my sales or $100,000 on advertising, then the conventional logic is looking at the advertising expense and saying, well, hey, if I just get rid of my advertising expense, that's going to now drive me and that's going to go to the bottom line and I'm going to make money which is true in the short term, right? If you're doing a lot of expensive advertising, you'll probably see some instant you know, benefits of cutting that out. But then what is the lasting effect of cutting out that advertising? It's gonna start affecting our sales and our sales are gonna start to go down and we're actually gonna be a worse off place than we really are. And so anytime that I'm looking at something for fixed expenses, where the fixed expenses I feel like are in a heavy, um, what I'm probably looking that, to do there is saying the expenses are what they are. 
You know, our expenses are half a million dollars a year, so be it. And so what we don't want to do here is we're not trying to drive down our expenses in an absolute sense. What we're trying to do is we're trying to drive the sales here so that those come back in line. And so if I say, you know, if I'm looking at this situation and I'm saying that our fixed expenses here are locked at $500,000. It is what it is. We're not going to get any better. This is just what this business will take. So what I need to do here is I need to kind of back into this and say, well, what do my sales need to be in order for this to make sense? And so if I have $500,000 of fixed expenses, then I need to drive $1.5 million in sales in order for that fixed expense to be around 30%. Now, I know if you do the math, you're going to be a stickler on this. You're going to say, well, hey, Hunt, that's actually 33%. You know what? For simple math, we need to drive about $1.5 million in sales. And if you remember correctly, if we're driving the sales, we expect a gross profit target of 50%, which would now put our gross, our cost of goods sold up to $750,000 it would now put our gross profit at $750,000. Now, with that same fixed expense, we are now driving $250,000 of profit. Not quite the target that we want to be at here, right? Because our fixed expenses are a little bit, but that's where we're going here. This number, more or less good or bad for your fixed expenses, is probably not going to change for your business. I'm going to be brutally honest with you. I've never seen someone save their way to a profit. Now, there might be some of you guys out there that their business has gotten bloated. There's too much money. You know, as you were driving sales, as you were going from 500,000 up to a million, you just bloated with stuff that you didn't necessarily need. And I see that a lot. Um, is it realistic to think that if your business is doing half a million dollars in your fixed expenses for the year, that there isn't areas that you can cut down on? Sure. I'm sure there is, right? You know, take a look at all of your fixed expenses. And what I want you to do is I want you to analyze that and say, hey, how is this either making my life easier, or my team's life easier, or how is this actually driving profit or dollars in the door? If it can't answer one of those two questions, then maybe we don't need it. Maybe we can cut that out. But that's something where we go from $500,000 in fixed expenses down to 480 or maybe even $470,000. We're not going to be able to save ourselves into a profit or profit level that we are going to be comfortable with. It's just not going to happen. And so that's the general overview here. That's the general inner relationship that I want you to kind of, you know, imagine here. And what I want you to do is kind of keep that in mind here when we go into this example. So I'm going to erase all that because I'm sure I'm going to go back and talk about that. So let's go over here to this. And so hopefully this is big enough for you guys to see here. And so what I did here is I actually took a real shops financial statements. And so I took a real shops financial statements and I went from the get go. You know, if someone's saying, hey, I'm not making a whole lot of money here. These numbers do not make sense to me. I don't even know where to start. And so what people don't get a lot is it's not that you don't understand your financials. It's more than likely that you don't understand your financials, how they are set up. You're not giving yourself a fair shake to be able to understand your financials because they're set up in a manner that's just not conducive to be able to analyze here. It's not giving you enough information or it's possibly giving you too much information. And so let's take a look at this one here. So I'm going to try to mark this up. So we draw on here. And so if you take a look at this, let's just start in our sales right here. And so one of the things here that if you look in sales is we have one category called income, right? I don't know if that's parts. I don't know if that's labor. I don't know if that's shop supplies. I don't know if you're selling a bunch of tires. I don't know anything about this business other than this is the sales coming through. And then you can see on there that we got another category called contra sales group. What is that? It's a negative amount. Is it right? Is it in the right spot? Who knows, but it's not giving us a whole lot of information here. Then I'm going to go down here and I'm going to take a look at the cost of goods sold. We have a general account called cost of goods sold. We have another one called cost of goods sold repair shop with a very small amount in there. Is that just parts? Is that, you know, including our labor? Is that including tires? We don't know. And then if we go down here a little bit farther, we can kind of dive into this and take a look at our overall expenses. 
we have a bunch of stuff grouped in here. You can see that the biggest one on here is going to be our payroll expense. What is encapsulated in that? Is that the owner taking pay? Do we have a service advisor? Do we not have a service advisor? How much of that is going to our technicians? We are not giving ourselves enough information to look at. If I'm looking at this business right now, and we go back to my you know, original idea here of making sure that the numbers are in line, we can kind of do the quick, the quick math here. I'll put this in black so you can see, let's put it in red here. And so if we take a look and we take a look at the gross profit, and so if we have gross profit of $239,000. And so rough math, you know, I'm gonna do this in my head here, but we're at about 48% gross profit. Okay, right off the bat, we're saying, hey, that's not too bad, but keep in mind here, remember that gross profit target of 50% that I told you was including technicians, including service advisor. This right now is only parts. That's not good, right? And so then if I go down, remember before, if we're looking at this, our total expenses should be 30% of our overall, um, should be overall sales. If I'm looking at this $283,000, right there, that is about 56% in fixed expenses. And so if I'm looking at this, what is the conventional logic telling me? Well, first off, it's probably not telling me a whole lot of anything because I'm just throwing this in and I'm trying to make these financials fit into a mold where they just don't fit into that mold because we don't have enough information on here. If I'm looking at this, then on the surface, I'm probably thinking, you know what? Our pricing, our profitability is okay on the front side of things. We're too heavy on our fixed expenses. But that's just really not the case here. If we go down here, we take a look at the bottom line, we're even more confused now because we're actually making money here. But we have this lovely one, right? The whole reason I'm in business, the whole reason that there's accountants out there, ask my accountant. And so you can see here, it's a little bit hard, but there's actually a negative here. So our net operating income is actually a net operating loss. We lost $43,000, but all of a sudden I have this ask my accountant of this income here of 67,000, which is now driving that we are now making $24,000. Everything else on here is screaming at me that we're not making any money, but somehow the bottom line is telling me that we are actually making money. And so a lot of people, you know, look at these financials and they just get completely confused, right? You know, you've taken classes, you're working with your coach, they're talking to you a lot of things about understanding your numbers. And you're looking at these right now and you're just saying, I'm lost. It's, I feel like I'm not making any money. I feel like things aren't going right. It's showing that I'm making money. I'm trying to analyze these numbers. I'm trying to look at these percentages like they're talking about and none of this makes sense because this is not set up correctly. And so what the natural progression is for people to do here is they say, you know what? This is the collapse version of our profit and loss. This is what it looks like when I condense everything down. Let me take this one step further and I'm gonna expand this. These are the same financial statements. If you're familiar with QuickBooks, you can either look at something in a collapse format or you can expand it so you see all the sub accounts. And so now if I look down through here, I'm saying, whoa, you know what? I actually do have some detail in here. You can see here, I now have labor. I now have part sales. Perfect. I can start analyzing some of that stuff. I'm looking at that contra sales group category, and I can actually see that that contra sales group is actually my discounts. Okay, this is starting to make more sense here. If I scroll down a little bit further, you can actually see that under that cost of goods sold, we do have some technician labor right? Mechanical labor. We do have some parts under there. We do have some other expenses. And so what this is telling me here is, you know what? Overall, these financials, they have the information in here that I need. It's all on here. Everything that you could ever want is in these financials. It's just not set up correctly to be able to analyze this. And so the cool thing about this, or, you know, kind of the, the downside to this is all of the information that I needed to set these up in an effective manner is already in QuickBooks. There's nothing I had to do. There's no crazy accounting things. All the information is in there. We just need to set this up in a format so that it's easily readable and it's easy to understand. And so you can go down through this. I mean, this turned into what? 
three or four pages when I'm looking at this in an expanded format. And three or four pages is not what we're trying to set up QuickBooks to do. What we're trying to set up QuickBooks or any sort of financial software is to be able to analyze this, take a look at this, pull out some numbers and get some quick hits. Where are things going right? Where are things going wrong? And in order to do that, we need to set this up in an effective manner so we can go back to the collapse format. And so what I did here was I actually took this information and I pulled it out and I put it in a condensed format. And so this allows us, once I started splitting this out, and once I started moving some of these categories around, it, it allows us to look at this in a collapse format. So you can see now some of the stuff looks the same, right? The total income, none of this changed. Right, still $496,000, but what I did here was I went down through and I split it out into the different categories, parts, labor, shop supplies, sublet, and then the discounts, and clearly labeled this stuff so that I knew what it was. Um, you can take a look at the cost of goods sold. Now I pulled out the parts, I pulled out the labor, I pulled out the shop supplies, I pulled out the service advisor payroll to make sure that we're analyzing all of that stuff correctly. You can look down at the fixed, ex or the fixed expenses or overhead. I cleaned it up, you know, put it in alphabetical order so it's easy to read. I broke out the officer payroll because officer payroll is actually a very important number because if I'm looking at the fixed expenses, if that's money going in my pocket as the owner of the business, I look at that a lot differently as something that's going out the door. And then also you'll see here when we get down to the bottom line, I'm using the wrong thing here. If we get down here to the bottom line, you can see now, once I started cleaning this stuff up, we actually have a true and accurate picture of where we stand. Someone's calling me, they don't know that I'm on this webinar. And so now, if you remember before, we were originally thinking that we had $24,000 of net income, when in reality, that's not the case. Um, this is a unique situation, you know, unfortunately for this year, um, you know, had a down year and we got the PPP money. And so that $67,000 I asked my accountant was actually PPP money. Now that needs to be factored in on the financial statements, but the profit or loss is not the place for that. Um, it's no longer going to be taxable to us. And you know what? We're not relying on the PPP to set up our business. It happened. We're going to recognize it accordingly, but it's not something useful in our day-to-day -day operations as far as analyzing these numbers. And so if we are looking at these financial statements, the first place that we're going to do, just like we talked about before, is we're going to start at the bottom lines. Let's see what it looked like on the bottom line. We lost $41,000, or more importantly here, we lost 8% of our sales. And so we had our sales come in, and 8% of it, it was actually ended up turning into a loss. We're completely upside down here. And without outside input, either the owner putting money in the business, or in this situation, the government putting money in the business, we're going in the wrong direction here. And so now we obviously know that we're losing money. Let's take a look at how I would analyze this business and how I would see what's going on for the business. And so the first place I always look is gross profit, because if you don't have a good gross profit, no matter what you do on fixed expenses, you're not going to have a sustainable business. You're not going to be able to maximize the potential of your business. And so when I'm looking at my gross profit, you can notice here we're at 37% gross profit, right? We want to be at 50%. So we know that we have a gross profit issue. When I look at down and I take a look at fixed expenses, I can see our fixed expenses are at 46%. Remember, we should be at 30% or better. Just like I talked about before, I'm not an advocate of nickeling and diming here. And if you really look at this stuff, there's really not a whole lot of expenses to cut. You know, this business has a pretty good reputation. We're spending $8,000 in advertising. That seems pretty fair. Now, one of the biggest fixed expenses here is officer payroll. $84,000. Now, I know that there's some people out there that are going to argue, well, hey, you know what? If the business is only doing half a million dollars, maybe it can't afford to pay an officer $84,000 a year. Any of you out here right now, would you go in and would you run a shop if you didn't own it for $84,000 a year? Now, some of you that aren't making much money might say, hey, I'd love to do that and just get a paycheck, but this is not an easy business. $84,000 is not an exorbitant amount of money for someone to make as an officer of the business, especially if you're in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you can take a look down here, the rent, we're at $46,000 for rent, that's not too bad. Pay and benefits group, that's the health insurance, that's some other expenses that we're paying for our employees, and it's just not something that's negotiable, not something that I want to cut without some lasting effects on here. 
And so I'm going to stick to my guns of what I said before, and I'm not even going to look at our fixed expenses. Our fixed expenses are what they are. How do we make this business someone that, you know, something that we're going to be able to be happy with, someone that's going to be able to generate the profit that we want and be a, sust a sustainable business for us in the future. And so what I'm going to do here is kind of go down through how I analyze the gross profit. We know we have a gross profit issue and pretty much we got two things here in this business. We got parts and labor. If you nail parts and labor, you're probably gonna be able to screw up everything else in your business and you'll still have a decent business. I see it all the time. I see people that you know don't drive great AROs, their fixed expenses are a little bit too expensive, but they kill it on parts and labor and overall the business looks pretty darn good. Same flip side, you can have everything else, You know, have all the other stars line up, don't have much debt, very cheap overhead, um, you know, very good, uh, you know, everything else in your business is going well, but if your gross profit on parts and labor isn't good, it doesn't matter. You're still not going to make any money. And so the reason why I like to set this up in a format so that it's split out with our sales and cost of goods sold categories, it allows me to analyze this. And so the first thing that I'm going to analyze here is like I'm going to take a look at our parts gross profit margin. And so when I'm analyzing parts, I'm looking at gross profit. I know some people look at it as a percentage of sales as the cost. In the end of the day, we're looking at the same thing. And so if we have $238,000 in sales and $150,000 in costs for parts, we can calculate the gross profit percentage, right? And so for those of you who don't know, gross profit equals sales less cost of goods sold. Right, so if I take my sales less cost of goods sold, I divide that number by the sales, I'm gonna come up with a percentage. And so I'm gonna take 238,000 less $150,000, which comes up to gross profit of roughly $88,000. I then divide that by my sales and I come up with a percentage. That percentage for parts is gonna be 37%. 37% parts cost of goods sold is not hateful, but it's not very good. Now, one thing that we also need to analyze here is we got this big thing here of discounts. And so once I factor in the discounts, and I'm not gonna show you the detail, but that discount is actually made up of two different things, parts discounts and labor discounts. Once I factor in the labor, or once I factor in the parts discount, we're really not making 37%, we're really making like 33%. So right there off the bat, I'm taking a look at this and I'm saying, hey, we got an issue here. A decent gross profit target for general shops is around 50% gross profit. We're at 33% right now. And so instantly we know that we have a pricing issue on parts. Are we using a matrix? Are we not using a matrix? Realistically, one of the biggest things that I see with people, especially on the part side of things, is they have a matrix, but they're overriding this stuff. You know, a lot of times I'm going down through and I'm looking and seeing what their gross profit is. And I say, hey, you know what? Just send me over a copy of your parts matrix and let me just see. And more times than not, I take a look at their matrix and I say, everything looks fine. Even on the matrix, I don't even see how it's possible for you to sell something even at a 33% gross profit on the low side of things. It's just not even set up there to be allowed to sell someone. And then when I talk to them more about it, they say, yeah, you know what? We use the matrix as a general guideline, but it usually is thrown out the window and you kind of do the smell test. You kind of weigh it and kind of wing it and say, well, you know what? We're just gonna, let's discount that. That seems like a lot. That seems like a lot of markup. And what you end up getting is you're driving yourself into the dirt and you're not making enough money. So parts, you know, I'm not gonna say that it's easy because none of this stuff is easy. You have to sell this. Parts gross profit is one of the easiest things to fix if you're willing to do so. If you're truly committed to getting a better gross profit, and 50% is a very realistic target here. If you're committed to getting that gross profit, it's as simple as tweaking your matrix or just sticking to your existing matrix that you have. If you stick to the matrix and you set it up correctly, the computer's doing all the work. Whatever you buy it for, it's going to mark it up and it's going to make sense and it's going to drive those gross profit dollars in there. Um, and so, you know, this is always something we're going to have to close the deal. You're going to have to make sure that you're not pricing yourself out of the, you know, out of the market. But 50% gross profit is something that I see a lot. You know, I have people that drive 60, 65% gross profit. That's something that's not going to be sustainable. It's something that you're not able to do everywhere. Um, for those about those out there 
that have Euro shops, that have diesel shops, you might not be able to get that high on parts gross profit. Maybe you're a little bit lower, but for you know argument's sake, we're gonna go with 50% and that should be a good rule of thumb for everyone to try to achieve here. And so right off the bat, if I'm looking at this, we know we have a gross profit issue. Part of that's gonna be parts. We need to either stick to that matrix, we need to adjust our matrix, whatever it might be, we need to be making more money on the parts that we sell. Remember, we got two things, parts and labor. If we nail those, we can nail this business and it can you know, be something that you know, we're proud of and something that's really gonna be able to sustain us in the future. So now that I'm taking a look at this and I'm saying, all right, our labor gross or parts gross profit after discounts is about 33%. The next big thing and really the only other thing here that we're gonna look at is what is our labor gross profit? And so when I'm looking at labor gross profit, again, we're taking our sales less our cost of goods sold. And so if I'm taking our sales less our cost of goods sold here for labor gross profit, you will notice that we're at 60% gross profit for labor. 60% gross profit for labor is actually not too bad. Um, this is a little bit unloaded here. So it maybe is a little bit on the lower side of things. But again, just like we talked about before, this is not including any discounts. Once I factor in the labor portion of these discounts here, I'm really not at 60%. I'm now down to 54%. Okay, discounts are fine. Discounts, if you wanna use that as marketing, if you wanna use that as advertising, that's fine, but you need to open your eyes and see, hey, are we selling this stuff and we're discounted all away? Or is this the cost of doing business? We have a pretty monstrous amount here of discounts. You know, over 10% of our sales is getting discounted away. And we need to understand that why or look at the impacts of it. And so when I'm looking, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Hen. I was just going to ask a question on the discounts. Yeah, go for um, it. So in our matrix system, when we're implementing the discounts, um, typically we would want to take 50% away from parts and 50% away from labor so that when it transfers over to our p and it'll, it'll break it out on how much we actually gave in parts and how much we actually gave in labor so we know which of the two to tweak if we're up or down, correct? Yeah, and that's a really good question. And I will try and give you a simple answer on here, but uh, it's a little bit tricky here. So when we're looking at discounts, the way that I want to look at it is really kind of two different ways. And so discounts that are what I call discretionary discounts, allowing us to close that sale, then that's something that I want to track separately than coupons and discounts and stuff like that. If you're doing a coupon, if you're just doing like running a promotion, or I have some people that literally discount every single thing that they have. But in actuality, what they're trying to do is getting to a set target. Um, you know, we want to be analyzing those discounts differently from our shop management standpoint to see where those are. But when it comes to the financials, ideally, I want to see those allocated to parts and allocated to labor, because I want to be able to see, all right, what is this doing? How is this affecting my margins? Are my margins okay? I'm just discounting it away or are my margins bad and I'm making it even worse by the discounts. Um, Asking someone how they recognize and how they record their discounts is kind of like asking someone to change their religion. I have some people that look as a fixed expense. I have some people that, you know, discount their sales. You know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, and depending on how much you have, it might make a difference. I have some people that just don't do discounts. You know, it doesn't matter where they put it because they just almost do none of them. But my other ones that are doing a significant amount, I would like to see that up there. And I'd like to see that reflective on our gross profit. So if we're taking a look at this and I say, all right, you know what, we're a little bit low in the labor gross profit side, but it's really not hateful. I still want to understand a little bit more about the labor gross profit side. Like I talked about before, parts gross profit margin is where I start and where I start a lot because more or less that's an easy one. We buy for something, we mark it up and sell for something else. There's no human involvement. It's literally automated or should be automated with our parts matrix. The tricky thing about labor is that labor has humans involved. At any times that we have humans, we have complexities. Um, you know, we have uh, trying to motivate people, trying to incentivize people, trying to utilize them, and it gets pretty tricky. But one of the first things that I want to look at if I'm analyzing gross profit on labor is not even what I'm selling it for and what I'm paying. I'm trying to take a look at utilization here. And so the first thing that I need to do, and this is the first time that I'm going out of QuickBooks to be able to analyze this or getting numbers that is not encapsulated in here, is asking, what is your labor rate? So first and foremost, I went and I asked this person what his labor rate was. It's $110. Now, we work with shops in 49 different states, you know, and so I see labor rates all across the board. 
And so for argument's sake here, I'm going to go and I'm going to say that this is actually a decent labor rate. He doesn't price some other stuff very well, but for where he is, $110 is a pretty good amount. Now, the thing that I want you guys to realize on this, because $110 just is not transferable to anyone. You know, I have people that are still in the $80 range and that's expensive for wherever they are. Um, I have people that are up to 185 in Southern California. And so the actual labor rate dollars is not something that's probably transferable to you and your business. But one thing that you should think about your labor rate is if you're not increasing it 3% every single year, you're making less money. Inflation, right? We are ignoring inflation. I got people that wear that like a badge of honor because the first thing I say when I'm trying to analyze your productivity, I say, what's your labor rate? $110. How long has it been 110? And I have people that come back and say, hey, Hunt, it's been $110 for the last five years. And they're proud about it. And I say, do you realize that if you leave it as $110, you're going to make less money, even if you do the same amount of work? Everything else in our business is getting more expensive. Our technicians are probably going to want to raise every single year. All of the parts are getting more expensive. All of our overhead is getting more expensive, but we've decided to leave half of our sales, which is labor, stuck at the same exact amount every single year. So whether you want to increase that every quarter, whether you want to increase that a little bit every single month, we got to make sure that's going up by 3% just to keep up with inflation. We don't have to worry about that on our part side of things because, right, we are marking up based on our cost. And so if I have a water pump that cost me $60 last year and it now cost me $80 now, it doesn't matter because the matrix is automatically going to increase that price. But on labor, that's just a set peg. Hey, I charge a certain amount of hours at a certain rate, and it is what it is. I don't get to change that. So make sure that the labor rate is going up there. Make sure that we're keeping up with our inflation and make sure that we're staying ahead of this stuff. And so I asked what the labor rate was. Perfect. I got what the labor rate is. Next thing I need to ask is I need to ask how many technicians do we have here? How many people do we have on the floor? And so for this example, we had two and a half technicians. No, we don't have half a person. We didn't chop someone in half here. We actually had three technicians for the first part of the year. COVID hit, got slow, just never picked back up. And so for the second half of the year, we only had two. So for your argument's sake here, for the entire period, I know this is January through November, but we had two and a half technicians. And so what I want to do here is I'm saying right off the bat, hey, $110 an hour, I know what he's paying his technicians, we can make this work, right? The pricing is fine. I think what we have going on here is a productivity issue. And the way that I analyze the productivity is I first want to back into and I want to say, how many hours did this shop actually sell? And so if we have $287,000 in labor sales, I'm going to divide that by our street rate of 110. And I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say we have 2,616 hours sold. Okay. So all I did was I took our labor sales, I divided it by $110, and that gives me 2,616 hours sold. We're ignoring effective labor rate. We're ignoring a lot of things here. What we're trying to do is going very simple math. Because if I want to get paid $110 an hour, that's what I think I'm worth. How many of those hours did I sell? So now we have how many labor hours sold. What I want to then do is I want to take a look at my labor inventory. I had two and a half technicians here. And they worked 40 hours a week. We're only open five days a week. And we're there for 40 hours. And so how much labor inventory did I have for this 11-month period? And so if I factor it in, you know, there's roughly 2,000 hours in a working year. I got text, two and a half texts there. For this period, I had 4,766 hours of labor inventory. And so what that means is I had technicians that were physically in the shop for almost 4,800 hours. I sold 2,600 hours of that. If you want to break that down to the day, if a technician is there for eight hours, they're averaging about four hours sold a day. That's not very good. A general rule of thumb for productivity, the way that I'm looking at this is about 75%. 75% is a very, very realistic target to hit. If you're there for an eight hour day, I want you selling six of it. That gives you two hours to go to the snap on truck, to take a break, to clean up your stuff, to road test, to do digital inspections, whatever it might be that I'm not getting paid for, but I need to be at 75% efficiency. 
am I going to be mad at you if you're at 100, 125% efficiency? No way. You know, I see people, I shouldn't say I see it all the time, but I have a handful of shops that do that. You know, if you remember before where I was talking about before, like my uh, diesel shops, my diesel shops are not going to be able to touch 50% gross profit on parts. It's just not heard of. However, for a diesel shop, it is very heard of for them to run 120, 150% productivity because they have these monstrous jobs that are 20, 30 hours and the technicians can do it in their sleep and that can consistently beat the book. All right. So there's inner relationship between all of that. But for this business, when I'm looking at it, this is our big issue right here. We have about 50% productivity. And so if I look at this, we are at 50, 50, 55% productivity or, or efficiency. I'm kind of using the two terms interchangeably, but essentially what I'm looking at is hours sold, hours there. Now we're going to go back to the discounts that we talked about before. If I factor into discounts, we actually discounted off 363 hours. And so if I'm going down here and I'm looking at this, we no longer have 55% efficiency. We're down here to 47%, right? After the discount. So it's only getting worse. So what we wanna do here is we wanna analyze this business and we wanna take a look and we wanna say, what is our problem areas with this business? If you're looking down through this and hopefully everyone drove this down cause I'm gonna erase these drawings here. If I'm looking at this business, I'm getting super overwhelmed here, right? I'm not making any gross profit. My expenses are too high. I'm making no money. I'm just really dejected right now, right? How do I save this business? It is just so far gone. I just don't even know where to start. Do I need to start cutting expenses? Do I need to start laying people off? Maybe I can't afford my service advisor. I need to go back on the counter. And I see people try to work their way out of this all the time. And what you're going to do is you're going to add a ton of stress to yourself and you're probably not going to get anywhere. But what we need to do here is we need to take a time out. We say, guys, if we do parts and we do labor, we do that well, we can probably make a business that makes sense here. And so if you guys remember here, we looked at this efficiency and we're at about 50% efficiency. Our target is going to be 75% efficiency. And so for simple math, if we're at 50% productivity or 50% efficiency, and we're doing half a million dollars, if we can get to 75% efficiency, this business is now doing $750,000, right? Not too bad, right? That is just sheerly filling up the capacity that we already have there. It's going to be hard to add $250,000 in sales if my techs are already 90% efficient. We're pretty much pegged out there. We don't, we don't have the luxury of looking at productivity. Now, the beauty of productivity, the beauty of maximizing productivity and efficiency, it is something that is a victimless crime. No one is mad about increasing productivity and increasing efficiency because we're not making pricing decisions here. We're not gouging our customers. We're not increasing our um, you know, prices to our customers. We're just sheerly getting more work out for the time that our technicians are there. So customers are happy because they're not paying anymore. Customers are also happy because a productive shop is meeting deadlines, is delivering stuff, is not delaying stuff, is not pushing people out. It's giving them the work. And then if you're paying based on commission or you're paying based on productivity, uh, productivity, your technician's also happy because they're making more money. And then most importantly, you as a shop owner is happy because now we have more sales going out through the door. And so productivity is the one I always like to hammer because it's not something that's going to affect the customer. Now, we talked about this before. We do have another issue here, right? Our parts gross profit margin was down. Our parts gross profit margin need to be fixed here. And we know what we did. We went down through, we looked at the matrix. In this situation, the matrix is actually fine. We just need to stick to the matrix and we need to get paid for what we really deserve. And so if we have a $750,000 a year shop and we have the gross profit uh, numbers that we want, this, isn't, this is no longer $183,000 of gross profit. Now we have $375,000 of gross profit. Remember, 50% gross profit. So we're pretty happy here. And so if we go down here, we got $750,000 in sales, $375,000 of gross profit. We still have $230,000 of fixed expenses. That's not going to change. It is what it is. And what that's going to leave us with here is now a hundred and well, I can't even do math here. A hundred and forty-five thousand dollars of net income. 
that's dead on pretty much at 20%. Conventional logic is what? We're not making any money. Let's cut our expenses. Let's start offing people. Let's start taking less money out of the business, right? Hey, I, don't, I can't afford to pay myself $84,000. I'm going to start cutting that. I can't afford it. We just showed how we take this business to fit into the constraints and fit into what we think a ideal business should run like. All we did was drive gross profit. All we did was analyze parts and labor and make, I'm not going to you know, oversimplify this, but essentially two small changes here. We mess with parts, we mess with labor, everything else fell in line. And so if you remember that example before, when I talked about this, when I was going through the general overview, if we're trying to make this business work, I'm not even touching fixed expenses. I'm saying, you know what, my fixed expenses are what they are. I'm not going to change that, but I'm going to build this business to work with the fixed expenses that I have. And that's exactly what we've done here. We've driven our sales based on the excess, excess capacity that we have, making sure that our technicians are being efficient. We have not touched our labor rate. We have not touched our labor matrix. The only pricing change that we made for our customers was increasing our parts matrix from 37% up to 50%. Everything else was just getting the work that we need out of the existing people that we have. Okay. Was that helpful? Does that make sense? I'm going to leave a little bit, you know, open here for you guys to ask some questions because I know we went through a ton of it here um, and hopefully you guys could read and understand it. So anyone have anything to add question on that? Try and shoot through my math there and say, hey, Hunt, this is not going to work. I have a question. Go for it. Um, compensation costs. I'm looking at my financial statement and my business summary report for 19 uh -huh. and um, my accountant doesn't really divide everything properly so um, on compensation costs does that include unemployment FICA workman's comp employee benefits and education training continuing education um, you're talking about on your financials you have something called compensation cost Yes. And now do you have do you have the labor category split out elsewhere and you just have that category still remaining or what? Like do you see technicians split out? Do you see service advisors split out? Or it's all yeah. just in one called compensation? Yeah, there's one uh, split out called officer and I'm, I'm not including that one. So you have officer and then everyone else is in a ball category, correct? Yes, the techs and the service writers. Yeah, and so the reason why I like to see this stuff split out is because it really all depends here, right? And so it doesn't allow us to analyze it if it's all split out to one thing, because if you look at it and you have all this in compensation, then I don't know, well, hey, do we have an issue with service advisor? Maybe our service advisor is too expensive. Is that all in technicians and we don't actually even have a service advisor? And so I can't even analyze the business because the officer is doing the service advising. So we always need to have the compensation split out to where it makes sense. Okay, but I thought on the um, at the beginning when you started, you said that the compensation costs were to include the service advisors. So the compensation should include a service advisor, but they're split into separate categories. And so you can see I got service advisor cost of goods sold here which is separate from labor cost of goods sold, which is our technicians. Well, do you have a recommended percentage for service writers? Because I do pay my service writers a lot. So service advisor, general rule of thumb, I want to see it under 10%. Okay. So the percentages are a loose guideline. I'm not a nickel and diming type person. I like to look at the big pictures. And so for some of you here that that number came to as a shock, whether it's too high or too low, 10% is a general guideline. And so Betsy, if I'm looking at your financials and I see that your service advisors are at 15% of your sales, that is then saying, you know what, that's jumping out at me saying that's a little bit expensive, but I need to learn more about that. Do you expect to increase your sales? Do you expect to grow your business? If so, maybe 15% makes sense. Or maybe you have a service advisor slash service manager that allows you to not have to spend as much time in your business and it's given you a lot of flexibility. And then that would really justify of why that's expensive. However, if you try and turn around and you tell me, hey, Hunt, I'm already at 15% of my sales for my service advisor and I need to hire someone else because we just can't keep up with that, then that's probably going to say to me, something's just not quite, quite right there. Okay. Well, I'm under 10%. So that's good. That's good. And I am thinking about hiring a third one though. But um, I also, I need to know if under parts, 
cost of goods sold, mm -hmm. uh, do I include cost of goods sold? Do I include towing, shuttle expense, inspections, shop supplies, gasoline, tools? No. And so parts cost of goods sold is just going to be directly parts, whatever's in part sales. And so the interrelationship between all of this stuff is if it is in here, if it is, if it is in the income category, I want to track the cost in here. Some of the stuff that you mentioned, you probably don't turn around and charge to a customer. And if you do, you probably do it from a different area. So for like towing, towing's not going to be in parts. If you charge out for towing, that's going to be in your sublet. And so you should have that towing in your subcontracted services. Shop supplies, you charge that out for shop supply sales. So that should be in your shop supply cost of goods sold. Shuttle expense, stuff like that, you might not even charge out to a customer. So I would probably look at that somewhere in a fixed expense because it's just something that we're going to eat. A lot of times for some of these, you know, benefits that we give to um, our customers that we don't charge for, I have a lot of people that look at that as, you know, a customer promotion expense, or they just put it as advertising because it's just kind of a sunk cost. So that goes under fixed expenses then? Usually. I mean, usually it's, it, we're kind of splitting hairs here because that's a kind of small amount. You know, it's wherever it makes sense for you. But usually I would look as if, I would look as a fixed expense if I'm not directly charging someone for it. So that's that's definitely tools. Most tools of the for gasoline. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tools, gasoline, car all that. rental for when we screw up and sometimes yeah, get them car rental, supplies. shuttle expense, stuff like that. Hey, that's just the cost of me doing business. Okay, so if I'm putting it on the ticket and charging them, then it's a part. Exactly, if because I'm not, it's not. Yeah, let I me mean, look at it literally. It's a cost of goods sold, so we're actually selling that. So if we're actually selling that, then I want that cost to be encapsulated here in cost of goods sold. If okay. I'm just eating that, I'm probably going to put it down here. And does health insurance go under the compensation costs? Some people look at it a little bit differently. I usually look at health insurance as direct expense for whatever category it is. And so if I have a technician that I pay a hundred grand a year and another $20,000 in health insurance, I'm going to put that all under technician costs because I want to try to recoup that cost. Um, some people look at it as an expense because they're saying, hey, you know what, that's a discretionary expense. That's how you're spending, that's how you're choosing to spend your profits. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It just needs to be factored into the equation when you're looking at it. Okay. Cool. Hey, Anyone what? else on that? I think we had a question here come in on the chat to go ahead. Who is asking that question as well? Hunt. Yep. Hey, I got a question. Um, one of the fixed expenses on uh -huh. the officer's payroll is at 16%. And mine is very similar to this. I got... 46% fixed cost, uh, fixed expenses with 16% being officers of payroll. Mm -hmm. And you want the expenses to be around 30. Mm -hmm. So I've always struggled with this. Is this, should that be, uh, should the officer expenses be included in that expense category or should it be at the very bottom under the net profit? Yeah, so it's kind of a little bit tricky there, Paul, right? Because there's an inner relationship. It's like, well, my fixed expenses are high, but a lot of that money is going to my own pocket. What I would step back and I would take a look at is kind of two extremes. If you're saying I never have to set foot in that building, it just runs without me, then I can probably see your argument of where you would say, you know what, bring that below the line. This is just something where I'm putting on there so that I don't get you know, audited by the IRS. It's not truly necessary for me to run my business. But if you're more acting like a general manager, you're there in the day-to-day -day operations, then you need to be paid accordingly for it. And if you're in there in the day-to-day -day operations and you need to be paid a fair wage, then I think that the business needs to be set up so they can afford that. And that should be in that 30% overall fixed expenses. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Um, I think Mike had one question on there, Maddie, right? Is that what you're going to tell me? And so go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I can read that for you if you want. Go for it. He wants to know what the average net profit percentage across all shops, all shops that Parmelis works for, works with is. And so the last time that we analyzed this, I can probably pull this up here. I think that the last time that we analyze this and we look at it on a quarterly basis, the average of all the shops that we work with, the net profit percentage is around 12%. Um, 
it's really, really hard to get a good number on that um, because just like what Paul was mentioning, you know, is is your payroll really high or really low, depending on if you're an officer. Um, a lot of our shops own the building that they're in. Some people are paying twice what the you know going rate is for rent because it's going in their own pocket. Um, I think when you get these industry numbers from a lot of people and you look at it, the average net profit percentage for the automotive industry is into single digits. Last time I looked at it, it was around six or 7%. Pretty darn low. Um, like I'm saying, hey, I'm shooting for 20%. I think it's attainable. I have people that run, you know, I was talking to my client before and she's about 35%. She's just killing it. You know, it's doable. You know, it doesn't work in every single situation and you got to see, you know, depending on where you are. Um, I'll give you a good example of, of sometimes I see people just kind of handcuffed to where they are. You know, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, the Bay Area of California, your fixed expenses are just going to be high. You know, the cost of rent is extremely, extremely high. And we're seeing rents as high as 15, 18 percent of your overall sales. Um, unless you can really maximize your gross profit, you're going to probably make less money. And realistically, in those places, maybe it's not attainable to hit 30 percent just because your overhead is going to be so high. And so it's a general rule of thumb. It's the kind of guide you on where things are going right, where things are going wrong. But there's obviously different stipulations for people that it just doesn't make sense. But rule of thumb, I don't think that there's anyone that can have a logical argument where you can't make at least 20% for a shop. Um, you might not be doing it now, but for most people, 20% is an attainable goal. Cool. So I wanna get into one last thing here, which is the balance sheet, and then we will open this up to questions. So, you know, going to kind of go down through this fast because you guys have already heard me talk about accounting long enough for tonight, but balance sheet is the same situation as we looked at before the profit and loss statement. If you do not have this set up correctly, then it's not going to be something that you're going to be able to understand. And I think we've got someone there that's not muted. Could you mute everyone again? Cool. Perfect. So we're looking through the balance sheet here. You know, this is something that often people don't look at because they just don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense, but that's probably by design because it's not set up correctly. And so I'm going to highlight a couple things on here of, of something when I'm looking at a balance sheet, especially before I have it cleaned up. And so anytime that you're on a balance sheet, there really should never be any negative numbers, right? So we got accounts receivable. We got a negative balance here. And then I got another accounts receivable. What the heck is going on here? This doesn't even make sense. I got the employee advance. I got the parts inventory. You can see here, those balances aren't even changing. Are those even you know, correct? If we go down here a little bit further, we can take a look at this. We got accounts payable. That actually looks fine there. But we have all these other ones, direct deposit liabilities, customer advances. These numbers aren't changing. A liner lease, it's negative a note payable for $241,000 that the balance isn't changing at all. What the heck is going on here? What is this stuff? We go down here a little bit farther. We got direct deposit liabilities on here. We got all these notes payable. None of this stuff is changing. So when this person is looking at this balance sheet and they're saying, well, hey, this doesn't make any sense. I'm saying, of course it doesn't make any sense. This is hard for me to even read, let alone someone that doesn't look at numbers every single day. In order to be able to analyze these numbers, in order to be able to understand these numbers, you need to give, your fair you need to give yourself a fair shake and get these things set up correctly so that you can understand it. So again, just like before, what I did here is I took this raw information. It was all in there. It was all accurate. It just needed to be cleaned up. And what we have here is we actually have usable financial statement. We actually have a usable balance sheet here. So you can see how much shorter this is, right? This all fits on one page now because we went through, we combined the accounts. The accounts receivable, we had two accounts receivable. The balances were actually right if you just netted the two numbers together. So we cleaned that up. Um, you can see all those old uh, asset accounts that just didn't change. We just need to get rid of those balances. They weren't right. Um, if you look down here on our liability side of it, this business really actually didn't have any debt. We had a bunch of old uh, loans on there that were already paid off. And if you remember before on the exercise that I had, that $65,000 that was over on the income statement is actually now pulled over here onto the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is, is going to give us a good job of telling us where we are. This is a snapshot. 
this doesn't show us how we got here. This doesn't show us, you know, what we did to get here. It just gives us a snapshot of saying, hey, what is the business doing right now? And most importantly, it's showing us this. How much money do I have in a bank account? Right. This is probably for those of you that don't look at your financials this much. This is probably the only thing that you're looking at your balance sheet for. How much money do I have in a bank? Hey, I got thirty thousand dollars. I might be must be doing something right. And if you want to get even crazier here, you're taking a look at this change here. Where was I at the end of the year? Where am I now? What is my change? I now have twenty thousand dollars more in the bank. A lot of people run your business like that. Hey, if I got money in the bank, I'm doing something right. I'm making profit. When we know in this situation, we're actually making no profit here. We're losing money. So if I'm just looking at my bank account, it's lying to me because I lost $41,000. Whenever I'm looking at the balance sheet, I always want to look at it in this format. I always want to look at it in a comparative format because it doesn't tell me anything if I just look at where I am as of November. I want to know where was I coming into this year? And so you can see here, we have December and we have November and I have the change. What this allows me to do is allows me to, is to show cash flow. I know that I lost $41,000, but where did that money come from or where did this money go? And if I set this up in a comparative format, this is going to show me cash flow. And I want to kind of quickly go down through and show you how I look at cash flow. And so if I go down here, we need to start from the get-go. We need to start with the income. And so we've already went down through and we've already analyzed the profit and loss. And we know that we lost $41,000. Hopefully going forward, we're going to figure out what we did with all of our profits, not how we financed a loss. But for this situation, we're going to figure out what, how we got $41,000 of money because we obviously lost that money. And so the first thing that you need to look as good, bad, or indifferent is how much money did you take out or how much money did you put into this business? So you can see here that this person actually took out another $4,000. So we don't need to find $41,000 of losses. We actually need to find where $45,000 went. So between the loss and the money took out, we spent $45,000. Now here's an easy one. We got $65,000 of PPP. Right. And so that's how we finance this loss. That's how this business was able to lose money and not go into any more debt. We actually got PPP money. And so now we actually don't have a $45,000 loss. We now actually have $20,000 that we need to figure out, well, where did that cash go? We didn't use all of that money in the PPP or we didn't use up all that money in the losses. We should have $20,000 left over. When I'm looking at this here, the next thing I want to look at, as I kind of drew on top of it, is I want to look at what happened with the liabilities. Did my liabilities go up? Did my liabilities go down? So you can analyze actually, you know, accounts payable, credit cards, or current liabilities. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at this line here. Our total liabilities. Our total liabilities actually went up $3,000. So if you remember before, we had $20,000 left over from the PPP. Um, some of our payables actually went up here, $3,000. So now I have $23,000 that I need to find. Where did that go? I made it easy for you guys. If I look up here, I can see my $23,000 went to two places. I didn't buy any assets. You can see none of that stuff changed. My undeposited funds went up a little bit. But that $23,000 is two places. I got 20 grand in the bank and I have another $3,000 out on the streets because my accounts receivable went up by $3,000. That's how I reconcile, that's how I figure out where the money went. Because what a lot of people do here is they say, well, hey, Hunt, I lost $41,000 or on the flip side, I made $41,000. I don't see that in my bank account. So it can't be right because I don't have it, but you can kind of now see the inner relationship. You can't just look at the bank account and you can't just look at your income statement, your profit or loss. There's a lot of moving parts here. Um, I will say that these financials are probably pretty simple for a shop. If you have other businesses, you might have inner company on here. If you have debt, the debt has to be factored in. Um, if you have different payables and different receivables where these things swing a lot, you can see how you can make some money but not have that money in the account. 
But this, in order, you know, why we always look in a comparative format is going to allow us to answer that question of, you know, show me the money. Where did the money go or where did the money come from? And so overall for this business, you know, we got two things we need to fix. We need to fix our parts gross profit. We need to fix our productivity, make sure that our guys are driving to work. Um, really, you know, the, the exciting thing for this business that I'm looking at here, we don't have a whole lot of debt, right? We have a little bit of credit card debt, $30,000. Hey, that's small. You know, it's, it's not a whole lot. We haven't dug ourselves into a very big hole here. We need to right the ship. We need to make sure that we're going to get into this year profitable. And we need to make sure we can start paying down that debt and go into the future of what we really want this shop to look like. Um, you know, 2020 was a weird year to say the least. And so when I'm going down through and I'm analyzing this for last year, I'm not going to beat myself up too much. You know, we had, you know, there's a lot of people that probably had some of the worst month they've ever had of their business. And so the productivity probably took a hit, right? And so don't look at it from an absolute fact of what could have been or what should have been. Just set goals for the future of what you want this business to look like and how you can analyze and how you can see what's going on to see if you have some of these issues in your shop. So that is it for tonight. That is all I got for you guys for right now. Um, so why don't we just open this up and go through any questions that you guys um, are confused by, want to add to, elaborate on, go for it. I have a question, Hunt. I wanted to know the differences between an actual, uh, if putting something into a tool expense versus an equipment um, expense and how that actually affects the, the numbers and how in preparation of performing our taxes. And gotcha. is there a specific dollar amount um, of what is considered equipment and what's considered a tool. 2,500 bucks. 2,500 bucks is, is the cutoff as far as the IRS is concerned. So if you have a tool or if you have a piece of equipment is less than $2,500, that's going to go on the income statement. That's going to go on the profit or loss. We're just going to expense it. If it's over $2,500, it's going to go into here the fixed asset. Um, now, notoriously, you know, if you got something that's three thousand dollars, thirty-two hundred dollars, we will probably just write that off. Um, you know, in at the end of the day, it really won't make much of a difference on your taxes because if it's in fixed assets, we can probably write the whole thing off in the first year, anyways. Um, but there's different rules and stuff like that, state by state. Um, but great question, yeah, because you can see that you could make a bunch of money, but let's say here that you decided to buy, you know, a $60,000 alignment rack. You could say, well, I made $60,000 this year in profit, but I got none in the bank because it all went here into my fixed assets. Um, you can also see on the same side of things that you could go out and you could say, hey, you know what, for tax purposes or personal property tax purposes, I just ran all of my tools and all the repairs and all the leasehold improvements I did down through my profit or loss statement. So the bottom line might look really bad for the year. Like, hey, we didn't loot, we didn't make any money, but I know that I did a lot of capital projects. I just decided to write that stuff off so I didn't have to pay the tax on it. So good question there. Another question, go for it. Who else got something? Hey, Hunt, Dutch here. How's um, going? No, Peachy, thanks. A <laughs> <laughs> couple of things. Um, you said that you looked at, and I understood uh, the parts and labor matrix uh, needed to be tweaked in this example in order to bring it up. But you said to increase the profit, uh, excuse me, productivity wouldn't be, how did you put it, uh, no, no one objects to increase productivity, but uh -huh. in reality, that's increased sales. Uh huh. Okay, I just wanted to, to be sure that that's what you meant when you when you said that. That's all. Yeah, and so you know that's a good question there, Dutch, because one of the things that I want to look at here is I'm going to show you. I probably skipped a step here, but any time that I'm looking at this, we know that we have a sales, we have a productivity issue. And so one of the biggest things I look at if we have a productivity issue is I look at this right here. I look at advertising. And so to me, if I have $500,000 of sales and I spent eight grand on advertising, that's practically nothing. Honestly, he's probably running, you know, somewhat quasi business expenses through advertising just so he can take the deduction for it. And so whenever I'm talking about productivity, I always ask, what is the biggest holdup here? 
do you not have the cars to work on or do you have more work than you know what to do with and you can't get the work out the door? For a lot of people with productivity issues, they have more work than they know what to do with. They just can't get that work out the door. And so that's why I'm saying in this example of we have more cars we know what to do with. So if we just have our technicians that are being more productive, we're able to drive work out the door. Whether that's more cars coming in, whether that's not having to schedule people out and losing those customers, whether that's having us be more productive so we're allowed to analyze the cars more and drive the ARO, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. But obviously, like it says, it all goes back. If you don't have the car counts, then maybe that's your productivity issue. If you have super productive technicians and you don't have the car count, then you need to go back and you need to drive the advertising to get the car count. But hopefully that answered your question. Thank you very much. Anyone else here? I'll leave it on uh, what's the percentage on it for advertising of expense? Um, percentage for advertising is usually going to be six to nine percent. It's going to be, you know, the general rule of thumb. Um, I'm sorry, on advertising, three to six percent. Six to nine percent for rent, three to six percent for advertising. I'll write it on there. So advertising, three to six percent. Rent, six to nine percent. These are not absolute numbers. And so Eileen, if I'm looking at someone and they're saying, well, hey, the cars are just really slow. No one's coming in. You know, everyone's just sitting at home. I'm going to look at that advertising. If I see that you're spending 2% on your advertising, then I'll say, well, you can't really complain about being slow. You're not even spending any money on advertising. The same flip side is if I have someone being like, well, hey, we just have more work to know what to do with and I see that you're at 8% of your sales on advertising, I say, well, this doesn't match up to what you're trying to do here. You know, on the flip side of one of the positive things that I'll see is, hey, you know what? I'm spending 8% of my sales on advertising, but I'm really trying to drive this business. I'm trying to grow that business. Then that makes sense. And so it's a good guideline. It needs to match up with the story that we're trying to tell here that what we're trying to do with our business. Anyone else? Good evening. I have another question. Go for it. You may have already answered this, but how about sublet sales? I have 70,000 for the year under sublet. It says I made 24,000 on that. Do I put that under parts or labor? Sublet's gonna be tracked completely separate. And so you can see on here, I'm tracking sublet sales. I'm tracking sublet cost. General idea on sublet, I'm trying to cover my costs, maybe make 15, 20%. We're not gonna get rich off of sublet. Okay. Cool. Bill, go for it. Good evening, Hunt. Uh, How are you? First and foremost, I want to thank you. I, I was driving uh, as I was uh, listening to it, and I ho I'm hoping it's recorded. Is it recorded? Can we? It see is it? recorded. Yep. Maddie's going to shoot out an email to everyone that registered afterwards. Fantastic. Thank you so much for what you do. It's, this is such an important part. I, I mean, I always get something out of these. The question I have is, do you have a service whereby you do um, P&L audits, not for the sake of tax preparation and anything like that, but mm -hmm. for the sake of the shop owner and his people to understand it. For me, after all these years, I'm going to bring my people in so that we all understand these numbers and where they come from. Mm -hmm. um, that, that to me is the, is the holy grail. You wanna keep your people, let them understand where these numbers are coming from so that if you're gonna bring them into an ownership stake at some point, maybe they buy your business, maybe you're partnering with them. Mm -hmm. If they don't read what you're reading, if you don't understand it together, to me, it's just a lost cause. Because they just they can't read your mind as to why you're frustrated one month and happy the next month. You're exactly right. And Bill, that's something that comes up a lot, especially when we're doing the productivity stuff. You know, I'll be talking to you and let's say that this is your shop. And I say, Bill, you're at 50% productivity. A lot of times when I'm saying that to you, that's never a shock to the shop owner. They say, I know I struggle with this all the time. And the next thing I always ask is, well, what have you told your team that you expect out of them? Well, what do you mean? I'm like, if you're unhappy with the amount of work that's going out, why aren't you educating your team on what you expect them to do? You know, that goes for productivity, that goes for margin, that goes for, hey, why are we not making any money? The team needs to be involved in on this and they need to say, hey, you know what? This is why I want you to stick to the margins because if you're looking at this right now, I'm not robbing anyone blind because I'm not making any freaking money here. Right. And so when you say, well, hey, that's ridiculous, Bill, for you to charge that for parts margin, you know what, bring that into the equation and let them know what's going on. Um, you know what, uh, I'm going to steal this quote It was actually from one of my clients. And I heard him talk about this on Carm the other day is a lot of people are concerned about bringing their team on here because they don't want them to see this number. 
if this net income is at a positive number, then they're going to say, well, you know what, they're going to come and they're going to hit me up and they're going to say, well, you're making so much money. But profit is not a four letter word. Profit is security. Profit means that we're going to be able to do stuff. We're able to invest back into our shop. We're able to invest back into training. And you know what? Profit allows us to have stability here. If I didn't have profit, then you know what? You might have a job today, but not a job tomorrow. So I love that. Yeah, I, I've kept many employees that were thinking of jumping ship by simply just showing them bank account and just saying, just so you understand, this is what we are capable. This is what I have in a war chest. Yeah. Ask the, ask the prospective uh, uh, employer who's going to offer you the five or six or $10,000 signing bonus, how much money they have in their account. And yeah. it's amazing how many times they understand. They look at that and they understand, you know what, stability, uh, steady as she goes, is a heck of a lot uh, a better business model than, than the fly-by-nights and not knowing, you know, what, what next month brings. So Exactly okay. right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Cool. On that same note, it also helps to show them because when you're growing, they begin to wonder why they're not getting more and more, you know. I mean, we just, as you know, we just bought a ton of equipment over the last eight months. And our biggest comment we've gotten is, must be nice. <laughs> yeah, you like, just show- You wanna write that check every month? It's all yours. Yeah, show, show them the truck payment bill and they might change their tune pretty quick. Right, exactly. And you know, it's, it's amazing that the guys can see that, our guys can see that, it's really great. Eileen, may I share a story? May, can I share a story with you? Years ago, what happened? I Go had it. I was managing a, a shell station and I thought 20% uh, uh, cut on this, on having no investment in this business, I thought was outrageous because I was working seven days a week, I was working myself to the bone. And I sat down with the, with this employer and I, and, and he looked at me, he knew that I was upset. I said, what, he said, what's going on? And I said, oh, I, I just feel like I'm getting stiffed here. I'm doing all the work and, uh, and you know, only making 20% of the profit. And so he sat down, God bless him for sitting me down and saying, you know what, if you want to be a partner tomorrow, I'm ready for a partnership. And, and he sat down and he broke down what inventory cost and what equipment and all. By the time we got done, I needed 150 grand to become a full-fledged partner. Guess what I did? I shut up <laughs> and, I, and I kept on working. To, to, to. And, and it's just a, a wonderful thing. So I, I totally hear what you're saying, but sit down with them and just say, you know, we can be partners tomorrow. All you need to do is do what I've been doing for the last 15, 20, 30 years to get to where I am today. So by all means, step up, go to the bank and go get yourself $350,000 so you can get a cut of this business. Well, on the same flip side too, you know, like unfortunately for the last year, we have a great example of like, hey, you know what guys, sometimes I'm gonna make a lot of money, but when times get tough, are you guys reaching into your pocket to cover payroll? No, this is me reaching in my pocket. This is me going to get an idle loan. This is me cashing in stuff to make sure that you and your family and everyone else is able to, you know, keep on getting a paycheck. Like, or these not are the taking sacrifice. a check for four weeks. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey, this mm -hmm. is me going without pay to make sure that my team is still intact. You're, you want to try and hit me up in the good times, but the same flip side, when there's those down times, you're not going to be here to try and open up your checkbook to make sure everyone gets paid. Cool. Anything else? I have a question, um, Hunt, and this may be another topic, but when we're looking at the P&L and we're looking at the bottom line, and of course, depending on how you're performing your taxes and whatever that income amount is, is transferring over to our personal tax return. Mm -hmm. If, if we are meeting 20 plus percent in our net profit margin, instead of transferring that over to our personal tax return as income, is there a way to reinvest that back into the business versus it coming over to us on a, on a personal side and having to pay more tax on that? So the short answer is no, not really. You know, and so whatever you make, you know, when you make a net profit, essentially you're going to pay tax on that net profit no matter what you end up doing, right? And so let's say that this is not 40, this is $100,000. So if you made $100,000 in your net income, essentially you're going to pay tax on that amount. Whether you leave that in the business, whether you take that in the form of distribution, that's what you're going to pay tax on. However, if you go and you buy a piece of equipment, what will end up happening here is we'll get depreciation. Hey, I bought a new alignment machine. That's now done to $40,000. Right? That's probably the number one thing that we have people do is, well, I'll go out and buy a piece of equipment, which is fine. It's a dollar for dollar you know, tax deduction. It's going to lower net income, but I just sp still spent $60,000 in cash. 
Um, you know, there's other things that you can do. You can go out and you can fund a retirement account, which is not incorporated on here, but maybe I'm going to max out my 401k and I'm now going to get this down to $20,000. You know, it's all stuff that you're able to do with the profit that's not really, you know, uh, indicative of, of the business making or losing money, but it's allowing us to minimize that. Um, but like going out and buying inventory, going out and buying used cars, stuff like that, it's not going to lower it down. Cool. One other question, if I may, Hunt. Go for it. We're going we're gonna to end with you tonight, Dutch. All right. Um, I have a two distinct labor rates. Uh -huh. One is for domestic and one is for euro. When computing productivity, I'm breaking it out so that I know how productive my tech is that's doing Euro versus the domestic and Asian side. Mm -hmm. Are you combining that when you're doing productivity or how are you balancing that out? <laughs> so you, I'll give you the easy answer and I'll give you the long answer. So if I'm doing it from this point of view where I'm getting a down and dirty number on here, then I'm going to say Dutch, you know, let's use you for example. So what is your labor rate? What's your, what's your standard rate? What's your Euro rate? Sure. The standard uh, labor rate is 118 uh -huh. and the Euro is 135. So your standard is 118. Your right. Euro is 135, right? Mm -hmm. So we got, I'm going to go here. So we got 118 and then we got 135. And mm -hmm. so Dutch, what percentage do you think is at your standard and how much of your business is at your labor, is at your Euro rate? You know, what's your mix? 50, 50, 20? No, 80. right right now um, it's 55% approximately. It's close. It's like 54.6. So I'm going to say 55% mm -hmm. uh, domestic and Asian and 45% mm -hmm. Euro. And so if I'm going to do something like that, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to analyze, you know, quickly kind of where we stand and what we need to look into. And so if I'm doing that, you gave me those numbers, and I'm going to call this 125. Okay. I'm just going to do a very rough amount because what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to give a general sense of how productive we are for an overall picture. And so whether this is 125, whether this is 123, whether this is 127, the idea is still going to be the same. If I have a good productivity, then I'm going to be at 90%. Maybe that's 88, maybe that's 92, but it's going to give me the general idea. If I have a crappy productivity, it doesn't matter if it's 48% or 52%, I know that's an issue. If I really want to go down through here and I really want to figure out exactly what my productivity is, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use my shop management software, which is going to give me my exact amount of hours sold. Yeah, that's what I wound up doing, but I didn't yeah. know because there's managerial accounting and then there's tax accounting. Yeah, and I didn't know the way you were looking at it. So yeah, okay. I'm looking from a like high level point of view. Like, don't get caught up in the details too much on that. You know, go if you're doing 50 50 like that, go right down the middle and say, hey, you know what, 125, whatever I sell, divide that by 125. That's my hours. It's going to give us, you know, arguably pretty close. So cool. Okay. Thank you very, very much. No problem. Thank you. So yeah. That's all I have for tonight. I want to thank you guys again for joining me, spending your evening um, going through this stuff. Hopefully it was useful. Hopefully you guys learned something. And um, yeah, Maddie, thank you for having me on here. Um, and I'll let you have any remarks if you want to close it out here. Thanks, Hunt. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I think that's that's all. Hunt, you left you on a good note and we'll see everybody hopefully soon. Uh, we have a bunch of other events coming up. You can find out at igonc.com. Look at our events. Most of them are free and open to non-members. Let me know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you so you. much. See you. Thanks, everybody.